Good evening. How you doing? We're in Jeremiah 33. We'll jump right in. So uh, if you want to know what's happening in the church, grab a bulletin. There's so much going on. I won't, uh, unless you can't read, then come on up afterwards. I'll read it to you. I really will. But uh, last chapter of Jeremiah, last week we saw King Zedekiah. He threw Jeremiah in prison. Zedekiah is the last king of the southern kingdom of Judah before the total fall and destruction of Jerusalem, before the final deportation of Judah into Babylon. Zedekiah didn't like the message that Jeremiah was bringing, that God was going to spank, he's going to spank us. Remember, Jeremiah is one of these. It's not like an outsider's preaching at these people. He's one of them. Jeremiah was from that region. But Zedekiah didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to hear that God was going to use the Babylonians in his purposes in our lives. Are you kidding me? He's going to use a pagan king? And Jeremiah was calling Judah at this point because the chastening, the spanking was a foregone conclusion. And Jeremiah was preaching, you need to submit to what's going to happen. And that will be the best outcome for you. If you rebel and resist, if you fight against the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, it'll end really, really bad. Because God's doing this now. He's spanking us. <laughs> Whom the Lord, what? Loves. He chastens. Okay, this happens in our lives too. God will chasten us. And that's a sign that he loves us. He must really love you, Juan, right? Juan's <laughs> sitting there. Juan's like, man, the Lord really loves me, man. I've been getting spanked. <laughs> but uh, Judah had turned their back on the Lord who created her, who formed her. Judah had turned her back and had turned to worthless idols that they made with their own hands. And because they turned from God and looking at God and depending on God and centering their lives around God, they turned from loving one another to using and abusing each other. You worship a worthless idol, a dead idol, you're going to end up becoming like the God you worship. It's a principle that happens. And they began to treat each other as worthless. That's what we do when we exploit another person, when we use and abuse other people. We're treating them as if they're worth less than us. And this is what happens when we fail to look to the God. You know, God who is in his very essence, he is love. He is self-giving love inside his own being. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When we look to him, when we live off of him, we do the same. He, he comes through us. We reflect him in our relationships. We love each other. You know, we honor one another. We don't use and abuse each other. That's a fruit of having fallen away from the Lord, falling away from just simply looking to him and looking at him, receiving his love. This is what had happened. And they'd set up these idols, these worthless idols. They were all over Judah. They were even in the temple of God. And so God's going to clean house, okay? God's going to clean house. Jeremiah's been preaching Jerusalem's going to be emptied out and leveled. But he's also been preaching. He's also been preaching that after 70 years, God is going to bring Judah back. Back to himself first and then back to the land that he has given them. Okay? And that through them, he was going to fulfill everything he ever promised to them. That through them, through those people, will come light and salvation for the entire world. Through them will come their Messiah, 
who will be of the line of David, of the tribe of Judah, who we call, we know now he has come, Jesus, the Savior of the world. But by this time, when we come to chapter 33, the, the, Jerusalem is already besieged. They've already been surrounded. This was a war tactic in that day. They had these cities, you know, that were walled cities. And then in between the cities, there was really nothing. And one of the tactics to choke out a city, you just surround it, you camp there, you don't let the supplies in. And eventually the people get so weak without food. Sometimes you could cut off the water supply. And then you just go in and take over. Right now, Babylon has already besieged the city. Many deportations have already taken place. We're about one year away here, chronologically, from the total fall and the final deportation. And so Jeremiah is in prison, and he says in verse 1 of chapter 33, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison. And the word of the Lord came saying, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it, to establish it. The Lord is his name. I love this. Thus says the Lord who made it, who formed it, to establish it. And here he's speaking specifically of these people and the land of Israel. Those people through whom and the stage upon which God brings his light and salvation to the world. The Lord who made it, who formed it, will establish it. Okay? Right now, if you're living in Judah, it looks pretty bleak. It looks terrible. Remember last week, God, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the prison and the Lord said, your nephew's going to come to you here in prison. He's going to ask you to buy a piece of land, the family field. And Jeremiah's like, why would I want to buy land right now? Land is worthless here. The Babylonians control everything. And then the nephew shows up and says, hey, Uncle Jeremiah, Buy the family land. And he's like, I knew this was the Lord. God was saying to Jeremiah, put your money where your mouth is. You've been preaching about this exile. You've been saying to the people, then God will bring them back after 70 years. Well, if you believe that, buy this field. Invest. If you think there's a future here, invest in it. And Jeremiah did. That's what we saw last week. And now God is saying as the place is besieged as it looks so bleak. I'm the Lord who made this. These people started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. His name was changed to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. He's the one who gave them this piece of land as their ancestral homeland. The stage upon which, the people through which will come light and salvation to the world. Do your history. It's happened. The Messiah has come. The word of God was birthed in that land through those people. I who've made it and formed it will establish it. You know, this is the beauty of surrender for you and I, of walking in what God has, is doing what God has for you and not striving after anything else. If you can find what the Lord is making of your life, what he's forming, you don't have to walk over people. You don't have to put anyone else down because he will establish it. This is the beauty of the total surrender to God. I only want what you have for me, Lord then everything I have, you've made it, you've formed it, you'll establish it, no matter what. I don't have to get in the dog-eat-dog, play the political 
you know, thing and cut people down at the company and talk behind their back and just the whole thing that everybody in the world that doesn't know God or doesn't trust God is doing. There's no need to strive and there's no need to worry. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, they lay up, they, they stay awake in vain. What is the Lord making of your life? You specifically. What is he forming? Do you, do you truly just want that? I found that when I get to that and I come back to that place over and over throughout the years, it's just this total rest. No one can take anything from me because the Lord, what the Lord gives, he guards. <laughs> I don't need to guard it. I don't need to worry about who's slandering my name. Let them slander, you know. If the Lord has this for me, he'll establish it. If he doesn't have this for me, I don't want to do this. I don't want to hold on to this, whatever this is. It's like Moses told the Lord, if you're not going up with us, I don't want to go, <laughs> you know. He's like, if you're going, I'll go. But if you're not going, I don't, I don't want to go. I just want to be where you are, Lord. I just want to be doing what you're doing in my life. I don't want anything else. This is the first step in the Christian life. This is the first step. If anyone comes after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and let's go. Let it and that includes all your plans, your, your little dreams. You know, God doesn't want to fulfill your dreams because they're too small. <laughs> God, God wasn't one. If you invited Christ into your life, he said, I came in, I've come into your life and I will never leave you. He, he was so emphatic. You know why? Because he wants you to forget about that now. And he wants you for the rest of your life to get into his life because he has a life. He has plans for you that are beyond anything you could ask or imagine. You see, this is how it works. Some of you are frustrated because you're always begging God to bless your dream and your plan. And God's like going, oh, I don't, your dream and plan is so small. It's so ridiculous. It's so, I, want you, I got stuff I'm doing and I'm calling you into my life now. I came into yours. Did you hear me? I'll never leave you. <laughs> Get that settled. Now get into mine. Get into what I'm doing. This is where we find the power and the blessing and the, the thrill as we walk in what he has. And what he's made, what he's formed, he'll establish it. That's what God's saying here. God is saying, in essence, to Judah, through it all, through the 70 years that are coming, this tough time of chastening, I'm going to finish what I started because I started you. <laughs> you didn't start yourself. You don't have to beg me to stay with you. I'm the one who raised you up. I'm the one who created you and formed you and made you. I'm the one. I'm the reason why you are what you are. You're a mess and I'm never going to let go of you. And after the 70 years, I'm going to bring you back and establish you. And I'm going to do through you everything I promised. Because he is faithful. That's why. Not because we're good, but because he's faithful. And he always finishes what he starts. And so God says, call to me. Call out to me. And I will answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things that you do not know. <laughs> that God is inviting. He invites his people. He invites us to prayer because he's eager to show us what he's up to. Even when circumstances like Judah is in here are looking so bleak, especially when circumstances like Judah's experiencing here are bleak. And we'll experience the rough valleys of life, the valley of tears. The, we'll experience the time of wilderness. We will. That's what this life is. It's a time of testing and struggle. It's a time of refining. This is what the Bible tells us. 
And God says, in the middle of your wilderness, in the middle of whatever, for whatever reason, you're in the struggle. Call unto me. Cry out to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. Things you could never figure out with your brain power. I'll reveal to you things about what I'm doing right now in your life and where this is headed. And it'll comfort you. It'll encourage you on the journey. So call out, call out to me. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of the city, he's describing the bleak situation that they're looking at, and the houses of the kings of Judah that have been pulled down to fortify against the siege mounts. They're looking around, and many of their houses have been ripped up by the Babylonians to form this siege mound, this barrier. God's saying, in essence, I know it's a depressing sight. I know it's a depressing sight. It didn't have to get this ugly, by the way. If you would have submitted to Babylon, <laughs> like Jeremiah was telling them. Like, remember, he made the yoke and he wore it and said, you're to, you're to bear the yoke of Babylon. Don't fight against them. But they fought with the Chaldeans, verse 5. And, and then they experienced all this death. They did, didn't have to get this ugly. I told you to submit. And many were slain. And they're looking, and it's so bleak, and it's so ugly, a mess that much of which they had made because they didn't listen to God. Nevertheless, as God has been also saying, he says, Behold, I will bring health and healing I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. With God, this is where it always ends. It always ends because he's gracious and merciful, because he's faithful. It always ends with healing and peace and abundance and blessing. Many times along the way, in the meantime, it really hurts. Some of it because we're rebellious children <laughs> and, and we experience the spanking of God. But God's saying, I'm, I'm telling you, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how bad it hurts, I made it. I made you, Judah. I made you, Israel, the land, the people. I formed you. I will establish you. You watch. You wait. You'll see. And if you believe me now, you can enjoy the journey a lot more. And God's saying that to you and I tonight. Listen to what I've said in my word, and you will enjoy this journey through this refinery a lot more. There'll be a lot more rest along the way. It's not that it won't be hard, but you'll journey with hope and with joy, knowing God's not left you. He'll never leave you. He's going to finish. You know, the impossible story of the Jewish people, of the nation of Israel, their story is one repeatedly impossible story. It's a sign to us that God will be faithful and he will pull off what is humanly impossible in our lives, in the predicament that you might find yourself in right now. The story of the Jewish people of Israel all through history is an impossible story. It's an impossible story. It's impossible. I mean, if you just take the modern story, it's impossible that a nation is reborn after 2,000 years, but it's reborn. The most expensive city in the world is Tel Aviv, Israel. Who would have ever, ever thought that? 150 years ago, it was worth nothing. It was worth nothing. But the impossible story of these people, of that land, it's a sign to you and me that God's going to pull off. He will pull off even what is impossible in the predicament you presently face. He says, and I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return. 
and I will rebuild those places as at first. Verse 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned, by which they have transgressed against me. You know, it's just a, it's just a fact. Okay, if we get real, you get honest. Life is painful. It's hard. It's hard to live. It's painful to live in a refinery. Especially when you're the metal and the world is the fire and God is allowing us to be melted down, to refine us. It hurts. I don't like pain. You ever had a meltdown? Okay, that's what happens to metal in the crucible. We have meltdowns. <laughs> you know, and when we're in pain, many times we run to things to comfort ourselves, things that we shouldn't run to that aren't God. We get covered in sin. This is what Israel, they're, 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 these guys are filthy in sin. And God says, I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to cleanse them. They've sinned against me. I'm going to pardon their iniquities they've sinned, by which they've sinned and have transgressed against me. And then it shall be to me a name of joy. These people, this land, it will be to me a, a name of joy a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth. And all the nations of the earth right now look at Israel. Many are mad and venomous and spiteful. How did they do this? <laughs> you know, and if you look back at the history of it, they bought pieces of the land and pieced it together, buying it off the Bedouins there. And then it started to work and come together and then they were attacked and they gained more land when they were attacked and the UN was involved in it that the nation's been reborn prospering that's just beyond comprehension and God said it will be to me a name of joy and praise and honor before all the nations of the earth I don't believe I believe this is speaking further down the road right now you know the press the, the the stuff that's going to happen there is even more to come. They will hear of all the good that I do them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. Whoa. Now I'm reading this and I'm wondering, is it going to be the people of Judah? The Jewish people that fear and tremble for all the good that God does for them? Or will it be the nations of the earth that fear and tremble? Almost in anger. Oh, we hate these people. And how can they have now the most expensive city in the world? The most, the, you know, the values of the properties and the things that are happening there. I don't know if it's speaking here. I, I looked at this. I re-looked at it. These promises that are spoken here, they certainly include the nearer fulfillment, the coming back from Babylonian captivity under Ezra and Nehemiah, 70 years after the exile. But they can only, these, per, these passages can only be truly fulfilled in the culmination of the new covenant when Christ returns in his second coming. The great and unsearchable things that God said, call upon me and I will show you great and unsearchable things. We know those things now. God's going to bring healing. These are the great and unsearchable things. He's going to bring peace and security and restoration and cleansing and forgiveness to a people that were nothing but rebellious and unfaithful. <laughs> I will cleanse them. I will pardon them. Notice there again. I will cleanse them, I will pardon them. Cleansing is the removal of guilt, of pollution, of defilement morally. Pardon brings the offender back into relationship, into a relationship of favor and fellowship. Notice again, they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. God said this. 
He said it to them while they were being surrounded and deported, completely, you know, just totally weak, impotent before this world power, Babylon. And God says, I'm going to bring you back and you're going to prosper so radically that the whole world is going to look and tremble for all that I provide for it. Wow. You know, under the siege, the sounds of the city, you can imagine how terrible the sounds is the walls were being demolished and the crashing sounds and the screams of despair. People fighting against Babylon and being killed. God said, don't fight. Submit and I'll prosper you in Babylon. But they're fighting. They're not listening to God. They know better than God. You know? And then came the desolate quiet when the destruction was done. Verse 10, thus says the Lord, again, there shall be heard, heard in this place. After the sounds of destruction and that desolate, eerie quiet. Again, it will be heard in this place of which you say now it is desolate without man, without beast in the city of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man, without inhabitant and without beast. God promises a better sound is to come. The voice of joy, the sound of joy, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, these parties in the streets. You know, I, when I, last time I was in Jerusalem with my son and with the church here, there was in the streets, you know, some kid was being bar mitzvahed and there was 300 people going through these narrow streets, you know, and they're all... They're all dancing and they, they're blowing horns and they're carrying the kid on their shoulders and it, it's contagious. The voice of joy. And then a wedding, you see, you, you keep walking through the old town in Jerusalem and again, I mean, it's amazing, the culture there. They're experiencing it already to, on one level. But God says, this sound, this is the sound I love. This is the sound I love. The sound of joy and the voice of the bride and the bridegroom and the voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise to the house of the Lord, and I will cause the captives of the land to return as at first. He's telling them all this right up front, even before they're taken away, even while they're being deported. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place, in this place, which is desolate, without man and without beast, and in all of its cities, there shall be again a dwelling of shepherds, causing their flocks to lie down. You'll see that beautiful sight of the shepherds with their sheep. This, this, this beautiful sight of peace. There's, just, there's so much security and peace that the shepherds are leading their flocks by the still waters and into the green pastures and making their sheep just lie down. What a beautiful picture. Instead of the chaos and despair of a city under siege, there will be a peace. There'll be goodness back in the city. In the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowlands, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, in the place, places around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, the flocks shall again pass under the hand of him who counts them. Interesting, under the hand of him. Now the Jewish Aramaic translation of the first century that's called the Targum. In the Targum, this, the, the, these Jewish writings... They substitute here in this passage the phrase, him who counts them, for the, they substitute it with the Messiah. The Jews saw this as a messianic reference. Though that the Messiah, all, the, all that have returned will, will pass under the hand of the Messiah, that he'll be actually touching the sheep 
we are the sheep. He'll be, he'll be like lovingly just touching them as they're all coming and streaming back into the city. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, it's interesting that phrase, in those days, at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. Now, David has already been, he's already reigned and died hundreds of years earlier. Okay? What is he talking about here? Well, God had promised David that through his lineage, through his genes, not just from his family, the tribe of Judah, but from the family of Jesse, David's dad, from his lineage, from his, a direct descendant of David will be the Messiah. And there will be an ever, he will, he, will, he will reign with an everlasting kingdom. And so here, God is, this is a messianic prophecy. In those days, at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. Okay, what's happening here right now with this deportation and this exile is Judah's being cut down like a tree cut down to the stump. And God is saying, like I said, like I promised to David, from his genetics will come up the Messiah. And he will be called a branch of righteousness. Isaiah speaks of this branch of righteousness. Isaiah 4.2, if you're taking notes. Isaiah 11.1. 1. We saw last week in Jeremiah 23.5. The first words of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. We say Jesus Christ, but Christ is the Greek for, he, the, he, for the Hebrew word Messiah. This is the gene, the first words of the New Testament. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is the one. This is the one that Isaiah spoke of. This is the one that all the prophets looked to, that Jeremiah was talking about. He shall execute judgment and righteousness. Notice, not just in Israel, not just in the tribe of Judah in Jerusalem, but where? In the earth. God's plan always in raising up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob he said to Abraham, through you, Abraham, all families of the earth will be blessed. Everything God has ever promised to Israel is for the world, for me and you. That's why we're interested here tonight. <laughs> that's why we look at this and go, wow, look at what God, that's why we're glad God has been faithful to those people and to that land, because through them will come the Messiah, the Christ for us. You see, he's for all the world, one for all mankind, you know. He will execute judgment or justice and righteousness, what is right among people in the earth. This is what our country suffers right now. This is an ideal that our country has embedded within its founding the aspiration towards this, but we haven't gotten there. It's not a totally fair place. <laughs> this is what we aspire to, that we want to move forward in, what we've grown towards and made progress, but we're not there. Justice means everybody's treated equally, equally highly, of equal high value, Rich people aren't favored in the courts more than poor people. Give me a break if you think that's true. Think of all the politi our politicians that have committed crimes that are not in jail. You would be in jail for that because you're not as connected as they are. This is injustice. Okay, and I could describe all sorts of forms of injustice that still prevail, but he, this one, this branch of righteousness that will come from the lineage of David, 
he will execute when his kingdom comes. And now his kingdom's been inaugurated in his first coming, but it will be culminated in his second coming, and then his will will be done. This is our prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. And it should be done among us because we're in him already. You know, so many times from a pulpit, there are pastors preaching at the world. It's so strange in America. It doesn't happen in Europe. It doesn't happen in Hungary. But you'll have a pastor preaching and angry at America as if America is a church. No, America is full of blind people that don't know what they're doing. The blind are leading the blind. And so the people of God are sitting there just getting pummeled and beat up as the pastor is going to keep preaching this message until what, America comes around? America is a nation. It's not the church. We're the church. And as we have come to see God in Christ, there should be justice and righteousness. The way we treat people should have profoundly changed from when we were blind. It should, there should, if, 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 if you aren't, if there hasn't been a profound change, I used to use and abuse. I mean, I got saved at 19. I used my brother. He had Asperger's. And I, was a, I, did, I was just a blind, lost kid. And I figured out I could get him to do my chores. And I took advantage of him. When I came to Christ, that was the biggest sin that I felt lifted off of me, the guilt. And I loved my brother until the day he died six years ago. And I, just, I, I wanted to just serve him and bless him. You know, I'd used him and abused him. I was, it was like I looked at myself, man, if the Lord hadn't stopped me at 19, what, how, who else would I have gone on to use and abuse and exploit? I don't know. But there was a change. There was a change. You know, I got stories of other people that I hurt and used and abused. But when Christ comes in, you, you know, this one who will execute justice and right what's right, that when he comes into me, that there's, there's, a, there's a substantial change. I'm not perfect. You know, when I've blown it, and I've blown it as a Christian, I'm compelled to apologize. You know, let the person know, you know, what I just did was total sin, and I'm grieved. And people are like, what? You're apologizing? That's amazing. And sometimes in our weakness, in our failures, if we'll be humble enough to say that was so wrong what I did. Sometimes that's just as powerful a witness as if you never made a mistake. Anybody else on, on, on the same page here? You know, I'm constantly apologizing to my wife. I mean, you know, look, I'm so sorry. That was not the Lord. <laughs> that was, she calls that other guy Greg. I'm Greg, and that guy's Greg. And she goes, Greg needs to go pray. I, I can't handle Greg. Go, go to Jesus, Greg, and come back, Greg. You know? Interesting. These great promises of restoration and blessing will be fulfilled in their fullness in the second coming of the Messiah, the appointed man, the branch of righteousness, who, will be a, who would be a descendant of David. He will reign not only over Jerusalem, Israel, but over all the earth, bringing justice and righteousness. In those days, verse 16, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. This is the name by which, this is the name by which she will be called. Notice this, the Lord our righteousness. It's interesting. This would be the title of restored Jerusalem under her Messiah who is the branch of the line of David, who is the branch of righteousness. Jerusalem will be called the, the Lord, our, our righteousness. No more will Jerusalem be called a place of idolatry, rebellion, shame, and destruction. But she would be a city and a people who truly found their righteousness in the Lord. The name given the Messiah 
in Jeremiah 23, 6, is here given to Jerusalem. She can have the same name as the Messiah because she reflects the righteousness that the Messiah bestows on her. She's reflecting. She's back restored unto God, and now she's reflecting God in her midst and the way that they treat each other. You see? As Christians, as Christians, God's not calling you to go out and be a Christian, you know. He's calling you to look at Jesus, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, he's calling us to draw our life off of Christ. And as we do, we reflect him. If it wasn't for Christ's intervention in my life, if it, if it, it, I, would, I, would, I would be some crazy monster exploiting and using, a narcissist just looking out for number one in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? But Christ came. And even now when I take my eyes off him, the monster comes back up. And I got to go back. I got to go back. I got to look back at him. And as I do, I reflect him. I bring glory to God. That's what it means. I radiate his beauty. You see, it works the same with us. Here, Jerusalem will share the same name as the Messiah because she will reflect everything that he is in that coming day. That day hasn't come yet. You know, these promises were fulfilled in part, again, under Ez when Ezra and Nehemiah brought them back and they rebuilt. But they will be fulfilled in whole, not in part, in whole, when Christ comes and establishes his kingdom on earth. These promises are a remarkable contrast to the present state of their destruction the siege around them, the deportations, how depressing is the sight in front of them. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man. Notice that, not, not shall never lack men, but a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priest and Levite lack a man, not men, but a man, to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings, and to sacrifice continually. This man is Jesus, the son of David, the king of kings, right? The, our great high priest. He's a, he's a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's, everything is rolled up in him. God's saying there will... David will never lack a man to sit upon the throne. This is speaking of the reign of Christ when he comes again. God's covenant with David is the promise to bring the Messiah who will reign from his line. You can read that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's amazing that when God sat David down and promised him. David wanted to build a house for God, and God said, you're not going to build me a house, David. You have too much blood on your hands. And David was like, oh, and God said, but I'm going to build a house for you. From you will come an everlasting dynasty. Read it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's just so beautiful. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be day or night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant. The only way that I will go back on what I promised through David is if you can completely tear down the laws of nature. <laughs> In other words, there's no way. I'm not ever going to go back on this. So that he may not have a son to reign on his throne and with Levites and priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. The host of heaven, the latest estimate. Do you know what the latest estimate of the number of stars in the universe? Say, take, take the number trillion, okay, trillion. Then put the number billion trillion. 
billion trillion, put the number 50, 50 billion trillion, and then put the number 10 times. This is the latest update. 10 times, 50 billion trillion stars in the observable universe. Okay, that's all they can see. That's as far as they can see, but what's beyond what they can see? There's more. God's saying here, as the host of heaven, speaking of the number of stars as it cannot be measured, nor the sand of the sea measured. How much sand is there on planet Earth? Walk down to Newport Beach, drill down how far down? Think of how many, in one handful, how many thousands and thousands of grains of sand. You know, you're there at the pier. But how far down does that sand go? How far out into the ocean does it all go? It goes through the whole bottom of the ocean on every shoreline of all the world. And you know, they, they say that they think that the number of stars is about equal to the number of grains of sand on all the seas, on all of planet Earth. That's a trip. Because those stars, our stars, one is a small star, and it's a million point two times bigger than the Earth. And there's as, there's as many stars out there as there are grains of sand on all, in all the Earth, and there at least some, most of them are at least one million point two times bigger than this Earth. What are we doing here talking about this? And if you don't believe in God, you got some issues. I mean, really. Like, we're here talking about this. We're here conscious of this. You know? Everything, especially consciousness, cannot have come from nothing. There's no way. It's the most illogical possible proposition anyone could make. But God says, as as the host of heaven, as the number of stars cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David. The descendants of David. What is this? You know, in Jesus Christ, you, you you are a son. You are a daughter of Abraham. Did you? It says in Galatians, we are all sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. And Jesus, the son of David, listen, he calls you, as a believer in him, he calls you his brother. So in this interesting way, as a believer in Christ, you are a descendant of David. Because the son of David said, you're my brother. Who's my mother? Who's my mother? Who's my brother? They came to him. But he who does the will of my father, they're my mother and my brother and my sister. It says in Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes people holy and those that are made holy, both Jesus and us that he's making holy, are of the same family. It says Hebrews 2.11. And so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Billions of people. There's two, three billion people on earth now that claim to be Christians. Think of all the people throughout history. What a trip. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, verse 23, saying, Have you not considered what these people have spoken? Jeremiah, are you hearing what people are saying? Are you hearing what the neighboring nations are saying right now? As Jerusalem is besieged, as the people are being deported, as their houses are being destroyed, and the temple is starting to come down. Aren't you hearing what they're saying? They're saying that the two families which the Lord has chosen, this speaks of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the ten northern tribes and Judah and Benjamin that comprise the southern kingdom. They're saying God's cast them off. God's forsaken them. Look at their cities being ransacked. They're being carried away. Thus they have despised my people. By saying, God's forsaken them. He's done with them. As if they should no longer be a nation before me. These two families, the northern and southern kingdom. There were some 
in that day, and there's some today. There's some Christian groups today that say God who once chose them is done with them and cast them off. There's a, there's a theology that is among some of the Reformed camp, not all, but they, they, they have a theology that's called replacement theology. That God's no longer interested in the Jewish people or the land of Israel. That now the church has replaced these people. They were saying this back then. Because it looked, it looked so bad. They're being carried away. Their city's being destroyed. Jeremiah, do you hear what they're saying? That they're no longer a nation. That they're... You know, that the Lord has cast them off. Thus says the Lord. Listen, Jeremiah. If my covenant is not with day and night. The most consistent thing that we know of in our lives is that the sun rises every morning and it sets every night. And if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, the laws of nature... Then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captives to return. They're saying this because I'm spanking them, and it says what it looks like. It looks like I'm done with them, but I'm never done. God's looking at you right now, some of you here tonight. You've been in sin and you've been spanked, you've been getting spanked by God and, it, and you've been wondering, has God forsaken me? And maybe people look at you like, what the heck is up with you, man? Has God cast you off? Feinberg, the commentator, says, nature will utterly collapse before God will go back on the slightest promise to his people, which includes to Israel the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and to you and I who are in Christ. You know that phrase appears, I think, 28 times in Paul's writings alone, describing you as a Gentile believer in Israel's Messiah. It says you are in Christ. You're in him. You're, you've been grafted in. Now you're a brother you're, you're, you're a descendant of David. You're a son and a daughter of Abraham by faith. God will not forsake his people. He hasn't forsaken Israel, and he won't forsake you. You know these guys with the replacement theology? It blows my mind. All these promises of God to Israel, to the Jewish people, all of his plans, you're saying he's done with that? How do you know he won't bail on you? If he goes back on what he promised to them, how do you know what he's promised to you that he won't be fickle and change his mind? You shoot yourself in the foot with this type of thinking. And God says here, never. Never, ever will I forsake them. And never, ever will I forsake you. Pastor, you can't say that to these people. You can't, you can, you, everyone's going to go out and live in sin. No, you're not. It's like saying God loves you so much that if you take a hammer and beat your own skull in, he'll still love you. And so your conclusion is I'm going to go beat my own skull in. No, sin, sin brings sorrow and pain. It brings its own chastening in our lives. The truth is, if you, go do, if you do go out and beat your own skull in with a hammer, God will still love you and pick you up and say, what in the world are you doing? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. God's committed He's committed to them. He's committed to us in Christ, in the Messiah. Wow. Amazing stuff. Lord, we praise you for who you are. 
Thank you, God, for your word and the revelation of your ways. Lord, we just confess we're, we're weak. We're so unfaithful in so many ways, but you're faithful. Lord, we thank you for your sweet, your precious promises. We thank you that we already know the end. We already know the end and it's good and it's health and it's healing and it's peace. Help us surrender along the way. Help us trust you along the way. Help us not to panic. <laughs> Lord, cleanse us from the things we've run to for comfort in the refinery. We pray, Lord, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, hallowed be thy name. We pray your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as in heaven. And before that happens corporately over all the earth, let it begin to happen more and more in us that we would reflect Jesus Christ. We would reflect that justice that right, that treating of each other right, that we, your church, would be that city on a hill, that beacon of your beauty. Lord, we would be the micro, the colony of heaven on earth that we are. Let it be, Lord. We just, we pray for ourselves as, as, at the packing house. We pray for all the other churches across the land, the millions of churches all over the world. The, out of COVID, Lord, out of this time of chaos and division and confusion, you would raise your church up to be more beautiful than she's ever been. We pray you do this for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone who agreed said together, Amen. Hey, say hi to somebody on your way out. We'll see you next time, chapter 34. God bless you.